is your first time here, that's very exciting. We're glad to have you. I didn't write that all down, that's a uh, But uh, basically, this is a meetup about uh, discussing computer science and mathematics, and uh, specifically excited about the, the places where the two meet, so the intersections between computer science and mathematics. Really, they're the same thing, and depending on whether you're a constructivist or a non constructivist, they may be exactly the same thing or maybe uh, completely on different foundations. Anyways, um, I digress. So first, I want to say some thanks. Oh, I'm Eric. I want to say some thanks. Number one thanks is to Bull May, who houses us in this space. Thank you, Bull May. Thank you, Bull May. Um, I also want to thank uh, Christopher Colate, uh, because similar to the last uh, uh, presenter, Russell O'Connor, last week, when Stephen and I started Intersections, I thought, who do I want to speak? I emailed Chris and Rolfing and this. He said, if you're ever in the vicinity, come and speak. And then he said, while well, I'm in San Francisco, being cool, I said, that it's OK. One day you will return to Canada. Uh, and now we are here, so it's very exciting. So thank you for coming back and visiting. And to Matt Mazuita, who's going to give his talk on the vaccine of choice again to a greater audience. So uh, a couple of reminders. One is that we do have a code of conduct. And we have this so that we can have a nice, safe, environment. Um, so I encourage you to read it all. And, 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 but also, just one quick reminder on that is that we try, sometimes the topics we discuss are complex, or we have all varying backgrounds, so we really want you to feel that you can uh, ask any question. I know it's really hard and people feel shy, so I might ask some of the dumb questions to lower the barrier, but also, if you feel the urge to correct somebody's response, try to avoid saying, well, actually, and uh, Try to avoid correcting someone else's response. And uh, if you really feel the need, try to phrase it in a, a very empowering and certain manner. Nobody likes to be told that they're wrong, even when they're answering a question. I will also be wrong on answering people's questions. So feel free. Do not do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll feel bad. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have two speakers today. Uh, Christopher Ola, who's a well, we won't show the semantics. Is a Teal fellow, or used to be a Teal fellow? Uh, Peter Teal is the is the libertarian CEO of PayPal, um, and is now an intern on Google's uh, deep learning team, which I'm sure is extremely exciting. Uh, and uh, is coming here. I don't know where you're going to be living forever, but is coming here from San Francisco currently to give this talk. And we also have Matt, Mas and we'll be giving a talk on neural networks. We have Matt Masuda, who is a Durian enthusiast <laughs> once brought a Durian to one of our talks. I we'll never bring a Durian again. <laughs> uh, is a postdoc at U Waterloo and a Banach algebraist. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thanks everyone. So, uh, Chris, we'll start. Take away. So, well, actually, I'm just curious who here has any sense of what's been going on in machine learning and artificial intelligence in the last three or four years? Some. Mm. So what I think a lot of people don't know is that we live in really exciting times for machine learning. Yes. Um, in 2012, uh, Alex Rzeski, Elias Zetskiever, and uh, Jeff Hinton from the University of Toronto went and published this breakthrough paper in computer vision using what we call deep neural networks to go and solve a, a, a computer vision problem, classifying images. So you're, you're trying to recognize the object in the image, and they can be in a thousand different categories. This is called the ImageNet. Um, and so over here, we have an image of a mount, an image of a container ship, and a motor scooter, and a leopard, and so on. And you got all those ones right, you can see all the stars. And then here, sort of somewhere, this talk gets us right. So this one involves a Dalmatian. I can't imagine why it was a Dalmatian. And this one involves an because it's top gas. And I'm really sure this one involves a convertible instead of the grill on the front of the convertible. Um, it's top gas is right 63% of the time. Um, and one of its top guesses is right 85% of the time. So, uh, a couple months after this paper got published, all three authors mysteriously ended up at Google. <laughs> I was lucky enough to go and work on the same team as them. Um, and they've continued working on sort of stuff. And just uh, a couple months ago, they went and they published a, a follow up result. Well, actually, it was not them, but a very large number of people at Google. Um, and now we're at 90, the top five, one of the top five guesses is right, 93.53% of the time. And human accuracy is 95% of the time. So, this is a really hard vision problem. And we're getting pretty close to approaching human accuracy. <clears throat> and 
another really neat result also out of Google. Uh, you go into the image and you go to generate a caption. Actually, a lot of people did similar things and they all got released around the same time. Um, so here we have a picture of people at the market and the model comes up with a group of people shopping outdoors at a market, at an outdoor market, excuse me. And there are many vegetables in the fruit stand. So, I mean, maybe fruit stands are the best thing to say there, but it's really, I think, quite impressive that a model can go and look at the image and generate an English sentence describing it. That's pretty cool. Um, there's been lots of other things. So uh, there was a couple years ago uh, a startup called DeepMind who went and demonstrated that you can go and uh, go in playing Atari, learning automatically from playing an Atari video game over and over again. Their model discovered how to play it really well and got superhuman accurate uh, performance on a bunch of things. And it just sees the image. It doesn't get a pre-processed image that goes and helps it figure out what things are or something that works directly on. And now DeepMind is all about you. It's true. Um, so there's been lots of other exciting results. Uh, voice recognition. Um, and sorry, I forgot to start my timer. Time, so that you can turn off the uh, Translation. So we just recently, uh, neural networks have gone and matched state of the art for translation. And it seems really likely that there will be a lot of progress in the next year and they'll exceed it. Uh, learning to interpret Python programs automatically from seeing examples of programs in their output. Um, going and discovering algorithms automatically. Um, this is really new stuff, not super impressive yet, but the fact that they can do it is really cool. Um, discovering mathematical identities automatically, it's a similar story. So, I don't know, it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, but it's not quite what I want to talk about today. Um, because I think that probably a lot of the details are, well, we could get bogged down in the details, and a lot of them are kind of arbitrary. We think that probably, you know, we've discovered something that works, but it's not fundamentally really, like, the truth of the universe is that this is how you go and you solve these problems. They, they, we just found something that happens to work. And so a lot of these details probably aren't fundamental. Um, and the details keep changing. So if I go and tell you all the details of neural networks, probably, you know, five years, a lot of it will be different. And that's not so interesting. So what I want to talk to you about is fundamentals. Because we're here and we're a bunch of math and computer science people. I think most people here are kind of interested in both. And so what I want to get is at something that, that's deeper than just, you know, we have this model that works. I want to go and talk to you about two things. Um, so the first is, I want to talk to you about, I want to ask, what really is the problem that we're trying to solve? Not, not I mean, you can, you can say, you know, we're trying to classify images, but what does that really mean? And then secondly, why is it that neural networks are, are so successful at solving these problems? Um, so obviously those are both really ambitious questions. Um, and we have 30 minutes to discuss them. Um, I guess it's fortunate that we're not doing something even more ambitious because that's already scary. Um, oh, sorry, I was supposed to say what I think. So, um, I, I, I think that the problem fundamentally comes down to untangling something in really high numbers of dimensions. Um, and we'll explain why we might think that's the case in, in a little bit. Um, and I think that the reason that neural networks are successful fundamentally comes down to function composition which is kind of an interesting thing. So, um, so let's, let's dig into that a little bit. So when I talk about pattern recognition, I typically mean things like going and looking at images and going and predicting you know, what's in the image, maybe where it is, things like that, or going and looking at you know, having a little segment of somebody, audio of somebody speaking and trying to recognize what word it is or what the phenomes are or things like this. What I want to try and do is get into it. what does it really mean to solve those problems. Um, so, I guess a first question is, can we write a program that will tell these images apart from you, a 5, a 0, a 4, and a 1? And it might seem initially if you haven't tried to solve a problem like this, like this is an easy problem. You know, a 4 has a, a vertical line and a horizontal line and another vertical line, a 1 is just a single line. But it turns out that you have all these really high-level intuitions about what, what digits look like, and it's really hard to go and translate them into something concrete that you can act on. Um, they're kind of, the more you try to go and implement them, the fuzzier they turn out to be. Um, and there's lots of weird exceptions and all sorts of things like this that start popping up. So it seems like an easy problem because your brain has these really extremely sophisticated tools for trying to process image data that you, it happens before you become consciously aware of, of your vision. But it's actually a really hard problem. So what would it even mean to classify those things? We can 
you think, if you, if you give me an image, we can go in any letter as a matrix. So we just have an array of numbers. And, you know, it's zero in a lot of places because there's nothing there. And, you know, in the middle, where we have the, the actual image, we, or the actual one, we start to get higher numbers. It's gray, so that we have some things that are around the middle of one five. And then in the, in the very center, we go up to one. And we can take that matrix if we want, and we can flatten it into a vector. So it's a 28 by 28 matrix. I actually didn't include the entire matrix. I subsampled it, but there would be a 28 by 28 matrix. And we can go and flatten it into a 784 dimensional vector. Yes. Okay, uh, so dumb question time. What's the, what's the approach for flattening up? It, sorry. How do you actually flatten it? It doesn't matter. We okay. do not care how it is indexed. I just want to go and have every entry in the matrix be an entry in the vector. Okay. Um, so there are some cases where we care about the structure of the matrix. For, for modern neural nets, there's a lot of tricks that you use to go and do a better job. But for sort of the general idea, we're just going to forget about any structure we have except that there's all these different dimensions which correspond to the intensity of some <coughs> Okay. So we get a 784 dimensional vector. Now, typical images. Sorry, actually, there was a second question. I should double check. Oh, well, I just raised my hand because you Excellent. <laughs> so. We, we, go, we can go and look at we can look at images and we can take look at sort of ask what what does what a typical vector in the space look like? And well they look really different from our actual images of digits. Um, and so what that tells us immediately is that the the images that we, we care about, they form a very small set within the space. They're embedded within the space of, of images. But not most images aren't images, most Images, 20 by 28 grayscale images, are not images of digits, or even really sensible images at all. Um, and we tend to think, if you sort of think about how you would go and transform these images in one way or another, or, or deform them, there, you know, there's a fairly limited number of ways you could do that that would preserve them being an image. Certainly there aren't 784 different ways you could go and distinct ways, orthogonal ways, you could go and transform it. Like you think, just you know, starting to go and darken a pixel somewhere, that will go and continue making something uh, a digit. And so we think it's something lower dimensional. Um, so there, manifolds in mathematics are, are sort of a generalization of surfaces. Um, so uh, if you go and you have a, say, a sphere, well, a sphere is an example of a two-dimensional manifold, it's a surface. Um, and it's locally, if you zoom in, you know, it's, it's curving, but if you look close enough, it, it looks flat. And you can have sort of three-dimensional things embedded in five dimensions or, or things like this. So we have uh, something embedded in another space, and it's kind of, it's locally linear. It's locally, if you zoom in closely, it looks like it's flat. Um, and so the natural hypothesis is that, in, in very generally, when you have data, uh, from different sources, it tends to form some sort of manifold embedded in this really high dimensional space. Um, and we don't know if that's true. It's probably, I think, it's probably kind of true. So I think people usually who have, who hold these sort of views, they usually don't quite literally mean it. So they don't necessarily mean that it's, you know, locally linear everywhere. Maybe it has a sharp corner here, and maybe it, you know, it, maybe it, you know, maybe over here the dimensionality changes, but people sort of think that something kind of in that similar flavor is true, if not, if not a strong version. Um, so I guess my question is, can we see the manifolds? Um, so recall that in we kind of wired sort of because we went and we we took our matrix, every entry was the intensity of a particular pixel, and then we flattened it in our in our the 700, 784 dimensional space we have. Every direction is the intensity of a particular pixel. So it goes from, from white to black or black to white. Um, and you can sort of imagine that to be a little bit like a snow globe. So the, the, the general story here is that if you go and you stare into this, 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 you sort of imagine we have a 784 dimensional cube, and you stare into it. And when you stare into it, um, it turns out that you don't see anything interesting. Um, the structure is, is too complicated. So we can, one, one thing is there's lots of angles we can look at this cube from, and we're in that particular visualization, we're just going to look, on it, look at it straight on. So we weren't going to try and look at it from a nice angle. And I guess the question is, is there some way we can find the perfect angle to visualize it from? And there is. There's a technique called PCA that I'm not going to go into. 
to. But it gives us a technique for going and if you have some really high dimensional data, we can sort of find the perfect angle that goes and preserves, in some sense, the most structure to look at it from. Um, so, if you want to look here, and over here, we can see we have ones over here, and we have zeros over here, and nines over here, and sevens, and twos, and stuff like that. And so we can see the structure the ones came over here, and the zeros are over here, but we're not really understanding. So, I play. No, it's not very good. Um, so, maybe there's some way that we could try to explicitly grab this manifold if it exists. Is there some way that we could try to extract it? Um, and so one thing we could do is we can go and think about our single point. We can ask, what are its nearest neighbors? So maybe, let's look at its three nearest neighbors. There's three points that are really close by. Well, what do those ones connect to? That are, what are closest to those? And so we get this graph, it's a nearest neighbor graph. Um, and it's sort of, if there's a manifold, that should try to follow it. And as we add more and more points, it should try to follow it better and better, because it'll, it'll start to fill in the gaps, and we'll be able to sort of follow all of them. And there's techniques for visualizing graphs. One, one next one is we go and we pretend that every one of the connections between these, the edges, is a spring. And we go and pretend that every node, every point, is just a charged particle. And so all the particles repel, and the strings hold them back together. And let's watch this happen. It's this one. I know it does work. This is the one that I was worried about. Oh, this way. So, what we're seeing here is the points slowly going from random positions to try and find a good way to be laid out in space. The springs and the propulsion are doing their job. color corresponds to a particular type of image. Um, so the reds are the zeros, for instance. See, over here all these are zeros, and those are sixes, and those are twos, and so on. So are they moving towards some kind of equilibrium state where they minimize the energy? They're moving. They're going, to, they're going to try and minimize the energy, and they'll get stuck in the local minima property. It's, I, I don't have any guarantees that it's going to be sort of the perfect solution that we'll get to. But, because we're just trying to use this visualization, if it just comes to something good, then that corresponds in some sense. In some sense, we've turned visualization into an optimization problem. We've described, uh, so I'm, and now I'm starting to use some, this doesn't particularly matter for the purpose of this talk, but we've described, we, it's kind of interesting, we can go and turn a visualization problem into an optimization problem um, and optimize it to try and get sort of the closest possible thing or the, the closest thing we can find to the ideal visualization. So the colors on the nodes, are those based on some, an algorithm's categorization, or are those they, algorithm those are the categories? Answers. Those, are, those are the answers. Okay. Yeah, cool. So right now, we're not trying to understand any algorithm. We're just trying to understand what, what the actual structure of the data is. So you can see that zeros are separated substantially from other things. There's a few things that are connected to it. So let's have a look at that one over there. It's a six, and it's a, really, a six that has a really big tail on it, I guess. So it looks a little bit like a zero. And as we add, add more points, as we get a little bit cleaner. Um, but it's very tangled. So, as we'll see in a minute, actually, it's, it sort of gives us a bit of intuition for the, the, how easy and difficult it is to unclassify this. It's pretty easy to go and get, you know, 90, 95% accuracy. You can just sort of lop off these growths that are sticking out of it. So you can, uh, if we have over here zeros, for instance, it's pretty easy to go and just have a plane go through here, cut off a bunch, and you get decent accuracy on something. But these, these sections that are kind of tangled, and that, that's where it starts to get hard. So we get some interesting intuition from the um, So there seems to be some sort of structure here, but it's it's it, it's sort of difficult to understand, and it's uh, it, it's very tangled. So it's kind of like a wave. 
but it's a really strange wave because every half period the wave oscillates into a different dimension and it never returns to the same dimension. So it's, it's a, a, I don't know, a multi-dimensional wave or something where it goes and it oscillates every step into another dimension. Yeah. And if, of course, the, the actual, an actual image is that's just a single pixel, um, it's a lot of pixels, so we would have to go and superimpose a bunch of these waves to get the actual manifold. But this tells us a little bit that there is at least some, some transformation we can do that preserves the image being some sort of valid image. If you translate a one, it's still a one. Um, and it goes and it scoops out some crazy, just, just that translation, because that's just one way we can transform it, that creates some crazy curve. And I say crazy because it's going in, every step it's going in switching dimensions and ending up just a very small transformation because it causes it to be you know, completely naively in a different position in space. Um, so we have this, this, this wave that it sort of, it's almost like a corkscrew. It sort of goes in circles or spirals around going into a new dimension each time. So it's, it's kind of very, very complicated structure. If you think about other things, so we translate on two axes, we can scale, we can go and rotate a little bit, we can go and you know provide, uh, perform different elastic distortions and things. So all of these, you know, they, it's not quite as elegant as translation, but they do something similar to this. So this, this manifold, if it exists, it's it's going it's going and flowing like wildly through the space. It's not just sort of gently going through the space. It's flying around in all sorts of crazy ways through a semi-complete four-dimensional space. So, it's very complicated. Um, so, sort of evidence of the analog process. Um, it also suggests some kind of repetition. So this is kind of a silly data set. I just have, there's two classes. There's a red class and a blue class. And, you know, if I a point here is in the red class, a point here is in the blue class, a point here is in the blue class. And my only point with this is just that it has a lot of repetition. It's the same thing over and over again in lots of places. And I think that probably a lot of real-world data has something similar to this, where there's the same thing going on in lots of different places. Um, but it's it, it's uh, it's more complicated than this. They're in different dimensions, and maybe they're scaled and transformed. But something of this flavor seems really likely to be true, and I think people generally have the intuition that it's true. So, is that mean? So, if we're trying to actually solve this problem. It's basically a function interpolation problem. We have a bunch of points where we know what the answer is. We know, you know, that, that particular point, that vector corresponds to a 1. That vector corresponds to a 0. That vector corresponds to a 3. And maybe we think about that if we want this to be continuous. That, that vector corresponds to a, you know, 100% confidence that it's a 1. And this one corresponds to a 100% confidence that it's a 3. And we have probabilities in between, so it's continuous. And we want to interpolate that function. And so, you know, mathematicians have lots of techniques for interpolating things, um, but it doesn't quite work. Um, and the problem is the, the problem is the reason why it's not easy um, is that we want well, we're working in this really high dimensional space first of all. So we're not just trying to interpolate on a plane or uh, a function on a line or something. We're trying to go and interpolate a function on 784 dimensions, or at least on a manifold embedded in 784 dimensions in a crazy way. Um, and we want to interpolate it in a way that we're going to be right when we get new, new data. It turns out that's really hard. Um, so there's a few sort of basic techniques we could do. One is called nearest neighbors. And the answer is, go and look at the, the closest points that we have, um, and go and have them vote. So you know, we saw one over there, we saw one over here, they're kind of close to me, uh, and probably a one. Um, or maybe you know, if there's a two nearby as well, well, I have 60% confidence it's a one, that I'm a one, and you know, this, uh, a third of my confidence is that it's, it's a, a three or something like that. So nearest neighbors is kind of interesting. Um, there's also the idea of a linear, linear SVM, and we just try to sort of draw lines separating the two classes, and the farther you are on one side of that line or the other, the more confident I am that you're you're more. Um, so I guess nearest neighbors sort of feels like fundamentally right thing in some sense, right? If if you you know what how how can you do better than guessing? whatever the, the closest thing that I've seen is, or maybe some sort of vote between the closest things, or some weighted vote, or something like that. That seems like the right thing to do. And if I had an infinite amount of data, it would, it would simply be the right thing to do. If I had all of the data, I could, it's basically doing a lookup table, and I could just answer my question that way. Um, but when we're trying to interpolate, sometimes that's not a very good thing to do. So over here, I have two curves, um, a red curve and a blue curve. And 
we can see that they're both both sine waves, of course, I guess they're sine waves. Um, and if we if we look at them, we can as a human we can go and say, well, that's very important to do with them things. But if we just look at things locally, uh, the answer that we come to is not that. Uh, we see that and there's all of the well, we we end up with something very different. And so what we wanted to do was extract something from the global structure about the data and, and then go in and try and answer it. You could imagine going through and learning some sort of change of basis. So if we could discover the right change of basis to go and sort of flatten out this wave, then we could use a linear SVM because they both just be flat lines with a bunch of points on them, and we get the perfect answer. So in some sense, the sort of thing that's missing here is the change of basis. We could, if we get the right change of basis, a linear SVM would be a great approach, just separating with a line. So neural networks are, are basically that. We go and we try to go in, we, we have multiple layers. And what the early layers do is they go and they bend the data. So here we only have one hidden layer, one layer that isn't an input layer or an output layer. And we can see that it's trying to so we're trying to classify these two curves. We have a blue curve and a red curve. If I give you a point on the red curve, you're supposed to say it's the red class. If you point on the blue curve, you're supposed to say it's the blue class. And I'm filling in other places so we can just sort of see what the algorithm is doing. Uh, and so what the neural network does is it bends the data and then it divides them with a straight line like an SCM. And answers the question. And so here's it going and classifying two curves. What it does is it goes in and just bends the data and pulls them apart. So they were in yellow at a tangle and it's able to do this. It's here what I call low dimensional neural nets. So because they're they're operating just on a low number of dimensions, they're not operating on 784 dimensions or you know, most data that we use for real problems is even a higher number of dimensions. Um, we're able to go and explicitly see what they do and try to explicitly understand what it is that they're doing. Um, and unfortunately, real problems are high dimensional and it becomes harder. But we can try to use techniques called dimensionality reduction, like the graph technique I showed you, to try to understand what's going on in these high dimensional spaces in two dimensions or three dimensions. And we see that originally, what was really tangled, like we saw, so this is the, the images, the hammer images that we were dealing with earlier. And originally they were really tangled, but after a single layer, it's found a way to go and stretch the space between the different classes and contract the classes and so on, so that they're a lot more separate than it can, so they're more easily. So this is the, the approach that neural networks take to the problem. We go and we bend the data, and then we try to answer the question. So here's really helpful. So one reason, if you believe the mathematical hypothesis, is that they can go and you know they can go and contract some maybe you know some sections of the mathematical to bring data closer together, and they can stretch the space between them, and they can sort of bring out the important differences and sort of get rid of some of the less important differences, and they can bend things so that they can be cut apart more easily and stuff like this. Yeah. And if you think about it, that that you can think, interpret that as sort of building up these high level features, these high level sort of concepts in the data. But another reason might be no local generalization. So um, I gave this example this is the data set before. And we, we can sort of imagine looking at it just a bunch of, we sample the data set, so we get a bunch of points from the red class and the blue class. It looks something like this. I very, very faintly included the actual answers behind there, but it's hard to understand. Um, I mean, if you just looked at this and you didn't have the answer behind it, when you infer that there's a you know, plus sign and an element of that, so oh, no, there's no reasonable way you can do that. But what a neural network can do is it can go and recognize that there's a repeating pattern and it can fold. If I fold this on the x axis and the y axis once, suddenly we have something where it's a little bit more plausible that we could start to understand the real structure. And we could fold it again. Maybe you know, we only fold on this axis here, so we get this over here, then this one here. And then maybe we go and fold it, you know, uh, uh, diagonally, and maybe go and then fold the circle, and you know, we can do things like this, and that that allows us to have a lot more data to go and understand the local structure. And so this is called non-local generalization of neural networks, uh, and it's sort of it's been demonstrated that it works. I have, don't have any explicit visualizations, but there's a nice paper by Yashu Benjo about it, uh, and it seems like it maybe is an important for the problem as well. So how do we train the network? 
Um, we've sort of, we've, I sort of said that this is sort of a nice way to go and solve the problem, but how do we figure out, you know, if we have a bunch of these layers and they start off doing random things, how do we figure out what they should actually be? Um, and so the nice thing about these models is that they're differentiable. We can take derivatives from the entire thing. And so I can give, have given a whole bunch of examples. I can try to go and ask, how can I tweak the model to go and make it slightly better? And I use an algorithm called gradient descent, where I just try to go and every step I go and I try to go a little bit better and move in a direction that makes things a little bit better. And eventually, I hopefully end up doing pretty well. And, you know, I, maybe I don't get perfect, but I end up with something pretty good. Um, so what's important here? Um, well, so the study of neural networks is pretty young. I mean, the idea has been around for a couple of decades, but the, these modern deep neural networks have only been around for since you know the late 2000s, um, and so we're, we're we have a very young field here. And I think something that's interesting about young fields, and or at least something I see in neural networks, is that there's competing narratives. It's not decided what the answers to these questions are, or what the there isn't some theory that everyone accepts about why things work. Um, there, every, there's lots of different stories going around, and people have diff different views. So um, I, I sort of I've, I've entirely avoided going and talking about this as, in terms of neurons. But there's people who like to think about things in terms of, of neurons and it being like the brain. And historically, these models sort of came from uh, trying to go and originally, many a long time ago, going and trying to create neuroscience models. And um, turns out that's not the really, uh, not very relevant. There are the, the these aren't very realistic models of, of, of the brain or of neurons or anything like this. Um, but that, that narrative still persists a little bit, and especially in the popular, the popular media. Um, there's this new narrative, um, this manifold hypothesis one, um, where we sort of think about things geometrically. And you might guess that I am quite biased towards this one. Um, there's more probabilistic interpretations where you think of, you can think of each dimension. So the way that you get this neuron interpretation is we think of each dimension Which is being a mount of neuron fires. So here I have two input neurons that right here, you know, this one fired a bunch, but this one didn't, and then over here, and you know, this one fired a bunch, and this one fired a quarter, and then you know, this one fired a ton, and this one fired all, and both, both fired and stuff like this. And so that's the, 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 the neuron story. Um, but uh, you can also go and think of these as sort of the variable, the sort of probabilistic beliefs of the, the world. So each each one of these independently represents some sort of proposition that we have some confidence in or something like this, um, some, some sort of hidden variable. And, you know, these, these narratives aren't mutually exclusive and there's less popular ones than these and, and so on. Um, so we have all these competing narratives. Um, so what I want to give you is my own twist on this narrative that we have about, about the manifold hypothesis. Um, and it's something that I've been developing in my head for a while and it's not very, not very mature idea yet. I hope in the next couple of months to go and publish something about it. I'd like to talk about it here because I think it's, it's something that is kind of relevant. We're interested both in computer science and math. Um, because it, it gets to functional programming and type theory, which is, I think, something that is also an interest in the intersection of areas. So, what are these layers except a chain of composed functions, of really simple composed functions? I mean, I, I think that's, that's, that's what they are. Um, and what, what exactly the functions that we have in each section has changed a bit. You know, we had we step what are called sigmoid layers, now we have ReLU layers. Um, using a linear transformation stayed consistent, but a lot of things have changed, and sort of the advice about exactly how to set them up has changed and, and stuff like this. But the things that's, that's remained consistent and that we think is, I think sort of everyone thinks is really important, is having this chain of layers, having a deep model. That seems really important. And it seems like there's something really interesting that happens when you optimize, you apply gradient descent, or you try to use some sort of other optimization process to optimize a chain of functions. Um, and I can't, I, I don't have any sort of deep theorems about that. I just have empirical evidence that these, these models, when we try to go and use the, these chains of composed functions and try to optimize them, we get these really impressive results. And part of it might be because they can go and fold the data or stretch the data, and that's really all they can do. And most of the model's capacity is only dedicated to going and stretching the data, and only a tiny bit of the model is dedicated to actually answering the question. And so maybe something interesting happens because of that. But I, I don't really know. It, it just seems that when we have these chains of composed functions and we optimize them, something really interesting happens. 
Um, it also happens that actually, uh, we're starting to see neural networks for those other kinds of higher order functions being used. Um, so in translation, they basically do is they go on, you have, a, you have a sentence as your input and you have a sentence as your output. Um, and the, the model at Google that's been released, that's matched the person's getting here with other techniques, basically does a fold. So we have a small neural network that folds going and gobbling up the sentence. Um, and then another one that doesn't unfold to go and produce a new sentence. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, in other areas of uh, people going and trying to do natural language processing, so trying to answer questions, I guess it's a happy review or a negative review, or a positive review or a negative review. Um, we've seen what people call tree structure networks. And what these are doing um, is they sort of they gobble up a tree in a fairly natural way. They go and in functional manner, it's like no way to catamorphism. Um, and so what they do is they go and they, they have the, these nodes and they just go and they, you know, the, they have a parse tree of the sentence and the, the first thing goes and transforms each word into a vector representing the word and then they go and combine this together to get a vector representing, you know, two words and then larger fragments and they go off the tree and they get a vector representing the whole sentence and then they classify that and it works really well. Um, so there's something, I, you start to see these examples of higher order functions with differential components embedded inside them being optimized. And it's sort of a recurring theme that we're seeing in different places. And then if you try to go and think, well, if you try to go and describe this, you can't just go and compose any two together. They have to go and agree on how the data is embedded. They have to agree on their representations. So, um, sorry, maybe I didn't introduce the term representation. Um, by representation, I just mean how the data is embedded here. So, this is one representation of the data, but this is another representation. And the layer assumes that the data is going to be in a particular representation. So uh, it's a lot like, you know, I have, I'm putting the data in a dimensional space. Um, but just like when I go and I, I go and I encode, you know, normal discrete data in, in a, on a computer in n bits, I have to choose some way to go and embed them in n bits. And so here I have to choose some way to go and embed my data in n dimensions. It seems like the way I do it is really important. Um, and I can only compose functions together when they agree on how I'm going to do that. And they, they learn together how to, they, they sort of come to a consensus about how to do it by being composed together and uh, learning together. But these representations, they, they, they have a feel of types. And then when you start to go and talk about some of the more sophisticated models and exactly how the representations relate, you start to see dependent types. You start to see examples where, you know, there's a variable that, you know, you can go and have different kinds of input and that results in different kinds of output and stuff like this. And so, I, 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 I'm, it's just an interesting sort of flavor to it, right? And I, I don't have any evidence that this is the right way. Uh, that the, but you can sort of imagine that, you know, maybe in 30 years, looking back at it, people are going to say, well, what were they doing with those deep learning people? They were getting all those really good results. They thought they were going and dealing with neurons. But really what they were doing was that they were, they were going and studying the interaction between optimization and composition, or, you know, the study of differential functional programs, or something like this. I, I don't know if that's going to be the case. I, I'm not really very confident that it would be. Um, I think it probably won't. But I think it's plausible. And I think it's a really interesting direction. It suggests a number of research directions, at least. So it's, it's an interesting idea. <coughs> um, so uh, I, I didn't talk very much about actual neural networks in this talk. Um, we had a limited amount of time. And I, I thought this was a bit more exciting than talk about. Um, but I, if people are interested, I want to refer you to two books. So, uh, first of all, Michael Nielsen, uh, who is a friend of mine and he's a really excellent writer. Uh, you might know him for having written the standard textbook on uh, quantum computing, um, amongst other things. Um, he has been writing a book on neural networks. Uh, and it's very introductory and approachable. Um, and he is an excellent writer. Um, also, Yasha Benjo, uh, Aaron Perval, and Ian Goodfellow from the Laboratoire d'Informatique de Systeme Adaptive. Uh, in Montreal, the University of Montreal, um, are, have been writing a book. Um, and it's more comprehensive. Uh, Yoshua is one of the leading authorities on neural networks, um, and uh, they've been doing some great writing as well. So I uh, look at either of those. Um, I also go and write a blog about neural networks and other things. Uh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, is it all right the picture of the last slide? Yeah, no, oh, because you, you, there are people who are going and videotaping the entire thing, so you are <laughs> definitely welcome to see it. So go and write about neural networks. Um, some of the, the writing is about uh, so some of the ideas in this talk are there. The functional programming thing is something I'm working on and hopefully get published at some point. Um, but uh, there are lots of
lots of it, visualizing data and exploring the structure of high dimensional data, um, and you know, uh, some posts going and reviewing the directions of research and stuff like this. So that might also be of interest. Uh, yeah, that's, that's all. Uh, so I am happy to answer any questions about how that works. Or